मिशन देवरेच्या या कार्यक्रमामध्ये सर्वांचं स्वागत आहे आपण आज बघणार आहोत फुलपाखरांची दुनिया त्याच्यावर बोलणार आहेत डॉक्टर कृष्णमेघ कुंटे आणि त्यांची ओळख करून देतील अजित वर्तक सर पूर्ण कार्यक्रमामध्ये सर्वांनी कृपया आपले व्हिडिओ आणि ऑडिओ बंद ठेवावेत म्हणजे नेट इंटरनेटचं बँडविट चांगल्या प्रकारे वापरता येईल आणि तुमचे जर काही प्रश्न वगैरे असतील तर ते सर्वात चॅटबॉक्समध्ये वापरा तिथून विचारू शकता तुम्ही ओके अजित सर to introduce today's speaker young butterfly specialist of our country dr krishna mek kunte he did his, he did his graduation from savitribai phule pune university and masters from wildlife institute of india from 2002 to 2008 he completed his phd from university of texas at austin usa this is title was evolution of sex limited mimicry in swallowtail butterflies from 2009 to 2011 he was post doctoral research fellow at the center of biological sciences harvard university usa from 2012 till today he is working at national center for biological sciences and presently he is associate professor he has published more than 70 research papers in national and international journals he has authored five books टू इन मराठी मला असं वाटतं बऱ्याच लोकांना माहिती आहे एका रान रान वेड्याची शोधयात्रा खूप प्रसिद्ध पुस्तक होतं ते आणि फुलपाखराच्या संगतीत अँड इंग्लिश बुक्स आर इन बटरफ्लाईज ऑफ पेनिन्शुअर इंडिया बटरफ्लाईज ऑफ उत्तराखंड मेनी फेलोशिप स्कॉलरशिप अँड अवॉर्ड्स हे हॅज रिसिव्ह सम ऑफ दे मार नाईन्टीन नाईन्टी सेवन टू नाईन्टीन नाईन्टी नाईन द मिनिस्टर ऑफ एन्व्हायरमेंट अँड फॉरेस्ट scholarship for master's degree program at the wildlife institute of india in 2002 sri jayendra tilak award in recognition of work on indian butterflies in 2002 kc mahindra educational trust scholarship for higher studies abroad in 2003 hartman merit fellowship at university of texas austin from 2012 to 2016 ramanujan fellowship from department of science and technology in 2018 he received american society of naturalists 2018 presidential award honoring an outstanding article published in the american naturalist in the previous year from 2020 to 2021 he was selected for earth watch institute's conservation of species fellowship mala ajun ek krishna mek chi athvan sangal avadel ki मी टपालाची तिकीट साठवतो आणि हे त्याच्या आईला कळल्यानंतर त्याच्या आईने मला त्याचा लहानपणी जमवलेला सगळा संग्रह मला दिला आणून आणि मला त्यांनी सांगितलं की त्याला पण खूप आवड आहे तिकीट गोळा करायची वगैरे अजून म्हणजे ते आहे आवड छंद आहे त्याचा तो दोन हजार पंधरामध्ये त्याने एक इंटरनॅशनल कॉन्फरन्स बटरफ्लाय वरती ऑर्गनाइज केलेली होती या सेंटर तर्फेच बँगलोर मध्ये तर त्यावेळी मी त्याला सजेस्ट केलं की अरे या निमित्ताने तुला स्पेशल कव्हर काढता आला तो बघ बटरफ्लाय वरती आणि तो म्हणला की हरकत नाही करू आपण तुम्ही काय करायचं मला सांगा मी आम्ही त्याला थोडीस हे सांगितल्यानंतर त्यांनी बंगलोर मधनं सगळं ते ऑर्गनाइज केलं फिल पोस्टल डिपार्टमेंट कडनं पुण्यातनं आम्ही त्याला आर्टिस्ट कडनं छान डिझाईन करून त्याचं हे करून दिलं पण मला विशेष कौतुक असं वाटलं की कृष्ण मेघनी त्या कॉन्फरन्सच्या वेळेला स्पेशल कव्हर काढलंच प्लस त्यावेळेला त्यांनी भारतातले काही एक जो दहा संग्राहकांना त्यांचे संग्रह मांडायला तिथे बोलवलेलं होतं बटरफ्लाय वरच आणि जबरदस्त लोकांनी त्या तिकीटाचे संग्रह फार सुंदर ऑर्गनाइज केलेलं बघितले आणि त्याचबरोबर त्यांनी त्यावेळेला माय स्टॅम्प हा एक जो कन्सेप्ट आहे पोस्टल डिपार्टमेंटचा तो पण त्यांनी तो तिथे राबवलेला होता म्हणजे माय स्टॅम्प स्पेशल कव्हर ऍज वेल ऍज एक्झिबिशन ऑफ दिस स्टॅम्प ऑन बटरफ्लाय असं तीन त्यांनी हे वेगवेगळे सगळं कॉन्फरन्स मध्ये ठेवलेलं होतं फार म्हणजे अतिशय कौतुकाची गोष्ट होती मला असं वाटत नाही की कोणी कॉन्फरन्स निमित्ताने आतापर्यंत असं केलेलं करू शकलं असेल वगैरे विथ दिस शॉर्ट इंट्रोडक्शन नाव आय रिक्वेस्ट कृष्ण मेघ टू डिलिव्हर इज स्टॉक वर्तक सर धन्यवाद या ओळख करून दिल्याबद्दल आणि मला आज खूप आनंद आहे मी परत मेनली मराठी लोकांशी बोलतोय फुलपाखऱ्यांबद्दल फक्त माझा मुख्य टॉक सगळा इंग्लिश मध्ये असेल ही सगळी माहिती मी इंग्लिश मध्ये गोळा केली आहे 
आणि जनरली इंग्लिश मध्येच मी टॉक्स दिले त्याच्यामुळे मुख्य टॉक मी इंग्लिश मध्ये देईन मला दिसतंय की बरीच लोक बरीच किंवा काही लोक तरी आहेत जी महाराष्ट्रीय नाही आहेत या ग्रुपमध्ये त्यामुळे त्यांनाही इन्क्लूड करायला मला आवडेल पण तुम्हाला अर्थात काही प्रश्न असतील काही कळलं नाही तर तुम्ही मराठीत हिंदीमध्ये इंग्लिश मध्ये कुठल्याही भाषेत विचारले तर चालेल आणि मी उत्तर देऊ शकेन ठीक आहे बिफोर आय स्टार्ट आय जस्ट क्विकली मेक शुअर दॅट एव्हरीबडी कॅन सी द स्क्रीन अँड द कर्स दॅट्स हिअर वी कॅन सी इट अँड दॅट ऑल एव्हरीबडी कॅन हिअर मी ऑल राईट ॲब्सोल्युटली ग्रेट ओके सो sir sorry krunanath if you can uh, start your video for few minutes okay just a minute let me see um okay can you see the video now yes sir yes, yes. thank you okay good good great uh so it's a pleasure to give this talk this was uh, originally made uh, about 5 years ago uh for a holy and of course holy being uh, um the festival of uh, color i actually designed this i uh, i came up with this title as a celebration of colors uh, but of course for butterflies this is relevant and interesting any day of the year so uh, i've retained that title because it's such a nice title and as the description mentioned that was circulated i'm going to talk about uh, how colors play an important role in uh, a butterfly's life so i'm going to tell you a few stories which are centered around uh, this main idea that colors play an important role um, uh, in almost every day life of butterflies and even the title slide that i've chosen uh, just shows this diversity of colors uh, across some of india's butterflies we have more than 1400 species of butterfly species in india this is just a very small sample of what we see in india okay so with that introduction i'll actually stop the video so that you can focus on the um, on the slides and my affiliation is of course given here and thanks again for uh, uh, mission devrai for inviting me to give this talk um so i'm going to talk about several stories but i've organized them in sort of two acts uh, so this is life of a butterfly in two acts and um, this again shows the tremendous diversity some of the butterflies like these two ones here are fairly brown and uh, they appear dull and only when you get really close that you will see that they have uh, this butterfly for example has very nice eye spots lined uh, along the margin of its wings and others like this uh, butterfly uh, for example or this one the common um, uh, silver line or this one here a uh, purple sapphire these are very striking butterflies with very interesting color patterns that you will appreciate uh, and notice and appreciate immediately but i'm going to talk about uh, various uh, ways in which these colors play an important role and the reason why i'd like to talk about butterflies in this sort of uh, talks is that um, i'll actually quote salim ali uh, our famous bird man of india uh, the last line of his uh, book the hall of a sparrow was sort of justification for why uh, he was he has spent uh, his lifetime to studying birds and with uh, a single a uh, change of a subject it actually applies to butterflies or anything else related to nature a form of escapism maybe but one that hardly needs justification so this is how i uh, look at studying butterflies and this is probably how any naturalist uh, looks at looking at any group of organisms whether it's plants or uh, any animal group or even something tiny that you have to look under a microscope um and the second reason why i like to talk about these stories is of course whatever i'm going to talk about has a very long history of research but the main reason why i like to talk about butterflies is to uh, popularize nature and biodiversity among people because as people grow older as i mentioned here they tend to lose this sense of wonder we have about uh, biodiversity around as kids of course we are fascinated by this 
but slowly we get busy with our uh, with our jobs with our uh, family with whatever else we are largely busy with and we sort of start losing that so the stock is a reminder of how fascinating and beautiful all the biodiversity around us uh, is and of course i'm going to uh, tell those stories as rendered through uh, part of life and this is of course another give, another reason to care about nature and the environment around us so with that introduction i'll actually get to um, the main bulk of the talk uh, so why colors why are colors important in the lives of butterflies so butterflies are relatively small compared to let's say some of the predators that uh, eat them or the predators can actually be smaller let's say spiders uh, which are relatively typically smaller than butterflies but they are very powerful predators they can overpower large butterflies so being a butterfly is a serious business precisely because everything large and small is trying to eat uh, them and there is no defense against these predators for butterflies of course they can fly away but often uh, predators can be fast or they can grab these butterflies before they are aware of the predators around them so butterflies and uh, butterflies employ various uh, strategy to escape these predators and i'm going to talk about these four which are probably the most common uh, commonly used ones in insects in general and definitely in butterflies and i'll go through each one of them first we're going to talk about camouflage which is in technical terms called crypsis the second one is masquerade which for a long time has been either confused with crypsis or with mimicry and i'll mention exactly how that differs from uh, those two so this is basically looking like something that um, is undesirable to predators something that predators do not want to eat and therefore they will not chase those butterflies or caterpillars whatever is masquerading and masquerade basically uh, means that you look like something that you are not and here it's used as a defense mechanism and aposematism is being toxic and then advertising it with very bright and bold patterns and the last one of course is mimicry to which i have uh, devoted a lot of my research uh, work in the last 20 years or so and this is mimicking these toxic and brightly or uh, boldly colored species so these are the four main strategies in which color is used uh, as a primary means of defense but this could of course be tied to chemical and uh, uh, auditory and other uh, cues as well so talking about crypsis can you spot a butterfly in this slide or else you can uh, draw something on the screen you have that ability to do it if you can do it if you spot a butterfly great i'll give you maybe another to the uh, seconds great so vivek bukke has perfectly identified and uh, uh, this is the head of the butterfly this is the forewing this is the hindwing of oh, several people have found it now so this is a fisher of a bark uh, and then this butterfly has these two lines with which this fisher beautifully uh, uh, continues and this is you will see that the color of the butterfly wing is very similar to the color of the bark and this particular butterfly uses this this is common evening brown and you will see lots and lots of uh, individuals like this which will match their background which will match their wing color with the background against which they are going to sit so lots of butterflies uh, are masters of camouflage but in india at least there is nothing that beats common evening brown not necessarily because um, it is the best but it it shows the most variation in uh, these wing color patterns and that is what helps us helps it uh, merge with a wide variety of backgrounds against which it sits so if you look at its upper side which is on the left here uh, on the forewing it has this very bright eye spot and this eye spot can be seen only when the butterfly flicks its wings for example when it's flying otherwise it cannot be seen and on the underside it looks exactly like a dried leaf or a piece of bark especially in the dry season forms so the upper side is more or less um, uh, uniform it more or less stays the same no matter which season you're talking about but uh, during this uh, during the uh, uh, monsoon 
it has certain eye spots on the hind wings, especially along the wing margins. But in the dry season form, those uh, prominent eye spots vanish, and then the underside becomes very cryptic. So it may have these dark lines on both wings, or it might have them only on one wing. It might have uh, different patches. It could be plain brown without really any um, uh, any other markings there. So it could be uniform dull brown with some very fine spires. <laughs> and each one of these different markings just helps uh, uh, merge with various kinds of backgrounds, whether it's soil, leaf litter, piece of bark, or even a rock. So whatever background that uh, may be found in a forest, this butterfly can uh, match uh, its color with whatever background that it will best uh, merge against. And this is how it um, uh, escapes from detection by predators. Similar strategy is used by other butterflies. For example, this orange oak leaf. On the left side, again, you have the uh, upper side with very bright orange bands. And then this beautiful uh, blue uh, purple uh, sheen um, or iridescence. And then on the underside, it looks exactly like a leaf. So this part, the uh, rear end of the wings, the what we call tornus of the hind wing, looks like a stalk of leaf. And then the forewing tip looks like uh, the pointed uh, portion of the leaf tip. And of course, this is the midrib. Uh, uh, where is the cursor? This is the midrib. And these other veins and other lines look like uh, uh, veins of a leaf. And then sometimes you will see uh, small brown spots which resemble fungal spots on a decaying leaf and so on and so forth. It's a beautiful camouflage. Um, so this is something that is uh, seen in a lot of butterflies. But then the question is how come predators don't learn to spot these camouflage butterflies? If you uh, uh, observe birds, you'll see that they have very keen eyesight. They can spot even very well camouflaged uh, insects. So how do butterflies escape that? Um, so to uh, prevent uh, predators from forming a search image for these uh, beautifully camouflaged butterflies, what butterflies have done is that they're exceedingly variable. No two uh, common evening browns, for example, will look the same in any... So somebody's, somebody's microphone is on. Can you please switch it off so that... Uh, uh, we can't hear you. So these butterflies are very, very variable so that uh, predators just do not have one phenotype, one wing pattern that they need to uh, look for. And um, if there's a common form and predators start forming a search image for that common form, that form will be eaten much more, whereas the rarer forms will not be spotted uh, just as much. And therefore, rarer forms will have an advantage and they will uh, increase in frequency and so on and so forth. So this is called apostatic selection in uh, ev evolutionary biology and behavioral ecology. So this uh, combination of very well camouflaged wing pattern and a very variable wing pattern is what prevents uh, search image being formed among uh, predators. And this is uh, how it looks. So this is a wet season form of the evening brown that I mentioned. And it looks more or less like that uh, across all individuals. But here in the big panel, you have the dry season forms. And as you can see, some of them are just almost plain with very fine striations or very few spots. Some of them are blotched, like this one has these black spots. And then you have some which are more or less plain brown, but then the lines have begun to appear. You have these where the lines are well marked, and then some areas between the lines are also. Uh, uh, darkened, and you see several of them which uh, play on that color theme. But all these four, for example, or five here and others, you will see that the background color is different. The dark bands are of different uh, color. And then how much smearing there is between the two uh, bands is also quite variable. So this variation is what prevents search image formation among predators. And you will see that, for example, this particular butterfly, which is slightly um, uh, you know, yellowish brown uh, uh, color with slightly reddish tinge, it's sitting among leaves with which it uh, camouflages really well. 
here you have a butterfly sitting on soil and its color pattern is like that so butterflies are born with a certain color pattern they can't change the color pattern in their lifetime but what they can do is sit in a spot where they will be better camouflaged here is another example this butterfly is sitting against uh, some soil and rock and its color pattern uh, matches that so everywhere you will see that these individuals uh, will um uh, just a minute uh will uh, uh, match the background against which they are sitting based on what their color pattern is like so we don't know exactly how butterflies know what they look like maybe after they are born as they fly uh, they see uh, their wing pattern or maybe they they trial and error and who knows how this work but the fact is that often times you will see that butterflies find a background with which they will match very well and that is how they will sit um uh, now the scripsis or camouflage is very different from uh, Uh, what is called masquerade and masquerade as i mentioned is looking like something that you are not and this is something which is much more common in caterpillars and pupae but also in some butterflies and masquerade is uh, typically in the form of many caterpillars and pupae looking like twigs or bird droppings here is uh, a pupa of common uh, mind somebody just pointed it out so he here is a twig uh, a branch a thin uh, twig of a tree and then there are these two pupae here and this is a silken body band before the caterpillar pupates it makes a uh, makes a band around it made of multiple layers of silk with which it rests against this now most uh, solitary butterfly caterpillars i mean uh, not caterpillars pupae don't look like this their shape is quite different they are uh, very narrow at the uh, rear end uh, very wide uh, around the wing area and then again very narrow uh, and almost pointed at the edge but this uh, butterfly pupa looks more or less like a stick it doesn't uh, uh, change its thickness very much and at the top here uh, is the head this is the tail end at the head it's uh, it has a shape almost like a broken twig right so this butterfly is uh, this pupa is very e easy to notice if you know what you're looking for but you will be hard pressed to uh, uh, understand immediately or figure out that this is really a pupa and not a broken twig right so this is what is meant by masquerade in cripsis or camouflage a, uh, a caterpillar or a bird or a butterfly is very hard to notice against the background in other word it merges with the background in masquerade these uh, insects don't merge with the background they in fact stand out but they are uh, uh, hard to uh, hard to be seen as prey and that is how they escape predators and i had a very interesting experience uh, of this butterfly one time i was breeding these butterflies for some uh, scientific work and i had kept them in a small cage and the first caterpillar went around and round looking for a nice twig to pupate and it didn't find a twig because i had only given them leaves to eat which were all green so this first caterpillar um, uh, just made uh, a made a pupa on this uh, blue stitching here yeah so this is the pupa of the common uh, mime and then the second caterpillar went round and round and the only twig that it found was actually the pupa of its own species but either the caterpillar did not realize that this was a twig or it realized but this was the best surface that it could find and therefore it anchored itself uh, for pupation and this line that you see here this one is a new uh, silken girdle the body band that it has made yeah and then in uh, in a day or so it also turned into a pupa so this is normally what it looks like a pupa on a twig and here you have a uh, pupa on another pupa because that's the best camouflage uh, a best uh, a, a fake twig that it could find and that is how this works and here is another example uh, as i mentioned this is a common mime butterfly this is the common mormon uh, butterfly and it comes in two forms the green form 
the green pupae are made among green uh, leaves and twigs and the brown pupa is made uh, along uh, branches and twigs so that its color looks like a, a branch. So again, here the pupae change colors. Common mime doesn't change color. It will always look like uh, a, a broken twig. Whereas the common mormon has a flexibility in whether it becomes green and camouflaging among green vegetation or uh, brown and mottled, which looks like uh, 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 a, a twig. So it, it's even more clever in the evolutionary terms in the adaptation that it has um, uh, evolved over a long period. Now, these are the two common types which are completely protective, uh, where the butterflies, either in caterpillar form, pupil form, or adult form, will just either escape notice by blending in the background or be prominent, but then appear like, a, like an undesirable uh, piece of its environment that predators will not be interested in. The third strategy that I talked about is uh, butterflies actually becoming toxic and therefore becoming unpalatable. So they're still a prey, but they're not a prey that predators would like to eat. And the way this works is that naturally most butterflies are uh, uh, edible to bird predators or insects like, pre uh, like praying mantids or other arthropods like spiders. But then some butterflies have evolved the ability to uh, gather up, to sequester all the toxic compounds from very specialized larvalose plants that they have switched to and uh, uh, sometimes other plants as well. So even in adult uh, form, these butterflies can take up toxins from plants, uh, uh, pile them up inside their skin, typically just under the skin or in some specialized organs and those toxic compounds derived from plants is what makes them toxic. In some species, they use um, precursors, toxic precursors uh, from plants, convert them into uh, their own specialized toxin, and that is how they um, protect themselves. And here is a caterpillar, uh, the plain tiger uh, butterfly caterpillar. It's very brightly patterned, as you can see, and even the butterfly is very brightly patterned. So this caterpillar typically eats toxic plants uh, of uh, the family, uh, uh, what is typically called as, uh, Asclepiaceae or Asclepiaceae. And now uh, this is often merged under Apocyanaceae. So these plants have compounds which affect heart rate of the predators, especially vertebrate predators. And uh, these chemical compounds are called cardiac glycosides, which the plant produces to protect itself against herbivores. You might know that uh, 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 cattle, cows and buffaloes, for example, and often even goats, which will almost eat anything, will not eat these uh, plants. So the common plant on which plain tiger feeds is Calotropis. Rui is what we call it in Marathi. So Rui uh, or Calotropis, if you have broken its leaf or uh, twig, you will uh, remember that it produces copious amounts of white sap, which is highly toxic. It's just packed with these cardiac glycosides, which affect the heart rate of uh, uh, cattle or any other kind of vertebrate. And therefore, uh, cattle just do not eat uh, these uh, plants. But over evolutionary time, over millions of years, uh, butterflies like plain tiger and uh, even some uh, grasshoppers and uh, several other types of insects have evolved the ability to digest these, uh, uh, digest or rather sequester these cardiac glycosides and put them under their own skin so that predators can't eat them. So this is how um, uh, aposematism works. Now aposematism has two steps as I mentioned. First is to be able to uh, sequester toxic compounds. And then the second stage is to be able to uh, show off that toxicity. So there's no point in being toxic and looking like, let's say, a piece of bark or a leaf or whatever else, because then a predator may not be able to uh, identify you as something deadly, something that it doesn't want to eat. Uh, whereas if they are very bright and they have very bold striking patterns, then that is something that a predator is going to remember once it eats this uh, butterfly or caterpillar the first time. 
Now, the interesting thing about aposematism, the way it works is that all these colors that aposematic uh, butterflies and uh, caterpillars and other insects uh, evolve, these are not colors or patterns that predators have an innate avoidance for, meaning that they don't look like something that predators will from birth have an aversion for. These are colors and patterns that predators have to learn. So after, for example, baby birds start hunting their, on their own, they will just try to eat everything in their environment. And once they eat one or two of these toxic butterflies and caterpillars, they will learn that this is something that makes them sick. For example, if they eat plain tiger caterpillar, their heart rate is going to be uh, much slower, but the heart is going to beat much uh, stronger. And uh, then the bird will learn to associate that particular pattern and uh, color pattern and uh, boldness. And in case of adult butterflies, it's flight as well. And then it's going to avoid eating anything that looks like that because it will remember that this was something that made it really, really sick. Right? This is how aposematism works. Um, now, once you have these toxic butterflies in the environment, there are butterflies which will uh, mimic these uh, butterflies, these toxic butterflies, and this is called mimicry. So in ordinary language, in ordinary English language, we call anything mimicry, right? If there's a person who, uh, who knows how to mimic calls of birds, we will say that this person knows how to uh, mimic calls of birds, right? So Kiran Purandre, for example, my a uh, uh, friend and in some ways mentor. He is very good at mimicking uh, bird calls, for example. But that is not really how we use mimicry in biology. Mimicry uh, in a narrow sense of the term, uh, as it is defined in technical literature, is when one organism looks like another organism, which is toxic, okay? So that is how we are gonna use mimicry for the rest of the talk. Now, mimicry is an amazing adaptation. Uh, this is one uh, form of mimicry. In the top row, you have all these different kinds of organisms which are protected in some uh, ways. In other words, they're defended against predators. Here you have a lysid beetle. Uh, so Dalkida is what we call it in uh, Marathi. So you have a beetle, you have a wasp, which is very aggressive and has a pretty nasty sting. You have a coral snake, which is uh, venomous. And then you have a weaver ant, which lives in big swamps and big colonies, and they are vicious biters. And if one ant attacks a predator, the rest of the ants in the neighborhood will just gang up on this uh, intruder, whether a predator or anything else. And it will they will just bite uh, this intruder to death. So these are deadly organisms, which most predators have learned to stay away from. And in case of coral snakes, perhaps there is innate avoidance. Snake patterns or snake uh, form is something that a lot of organisms, especially vertebrates, avoid uh, uh, from birth. They have this instinctive avoidance of these patterns. And then you have this uh, uh, moth, which has the same color pattern as this beetle. You have a fly, which is really not protected. It doesn't sting. It doesn't have any other chemical protection, but it looks like this wasp. And of course, there's this milk snake, which looks like uh, the uh, coral snake. And here's an interesting spider. You might have actually seen it in uh, parts of Maharashtra or Goa or uh, uh, southward in uh, the Western Ghats or even in Central India sometimes. So here is a spider which had just assumed the form of an ant. The entire species has uh, turned into this form where where it uses these, uh, if you remember, insects have four, uh, three pairs of legs, total six legs, and spiders have four pairs of legs. So it, uh, its first pair of uh, legs has become very long and often it holds them in the front, waving them up and down as if the antennae of the uh, ant, right? So you have this one, uh, two and three pairs of legs. And here you have the first uh, uh, red thing that appears, which is very long antennae. So uh, spiders, of course, don't have uh, antennae, uh, long antennae at least, but then it uses this first pair of legs as if they were antennae. And that is how it has uh, nearly perfected the mimetic uh, appearance. 
And this specific type of mimicry is called Batesian based on uh, uh, this British naturalist, Henry Walter Bates, uh, who proposed this kind of mimicry um, way back in 1860s. And therefore this type of mimicry is called Batesian mimicry. And this is something that I've devoted the last 20 years of my academic career studying. And therefore I'll talk about this for the next two, three slides. Batesian mimicry is a classic example of adaptation by natural selection. And the way that it works is that you have three partners in this uh, relationship. You have the toxic butterfly, uh, which ideally any predator would like to eat, for example, this uh, green beetle. But then there's this mutually, mutualistic interaction between the toxic butterfly and the predator. The toxic butterfly, of course, doesn't want to get eaten and the bird doesn't want, the predator doesn't want to eat something that's going to make it sick. So after young birds learn to avoid this particular pattern because it's aposomatic, from that initial experience onward, it won't uh, try to eat that. So in that sense, it's a mutualistic relationship. If the butterfly becomes less toxic, the bird will be perfectly happy to eat it. But because the butterfly is very well defended, the bird doesn't want to eat it. And then you have a parasite, which is the Batesian mimic. And uh, these two butterflies, as you can see, look fairly similar. Their color pattern is similar. The wingtips are black with white markings. So we understand several things about this relationship. A, we know what the goal of this uh, mimetic butterfly is to look like uh, this butterfly. And we know specific wing pattern elements which are under selection and the selective agent for this very close resemblance is this bird, is this predator, right? So we know uh, what we call the adaptive peak in evolutionary biology, which is a, a phenotype space in this case where uh, the butterflies are gonna be protected if they look like that. We know the selection agent, uh, the agent of natural selection, a predator in this case. We know what it looks for, the specific wing color patterns. And then we know where this butterfly started. So interestingly, this butterfly that I'm showing here is a female denied fly. Its male looks like this, nothing like the female. Yeah? And we know that this is its ancestral pattern based on its evolutionary history. So the male uh, has remained like its uh, ancestor and the female has selectively moved away from this pattern to look like the plain tiger butterfly. Yeah? So because we know all these aspects of mimicry, this has been a very attractive system for a lot of biologists to study, not actually just biologists, even mathematicians who model um, various kinds of ecological systems. They have been interested among uh, biologists, ecologists have been interested in studying this in nature. And then of course, geneticists have been interested in studying how these wing patterns develop in the pupa. So uh, a wide variety of biologists have been very interested in studying this. And of course the mimicry works because if you have alternative prey like this one, which is not mimetic, then the predator would rather eat that uh, butterfly. This is what the underside of the male looks like. So a predator is more likely to eat uh, non-mimetic uh, butterflies and non aposematic butterflies than these two categories, which are a little bit protected. Um, so Batesian mimicry is actually very common in butterflies and even outside of uh, butterflies, this is very common. In each one of these blue boxes, there is a separate kind of uh, stage of mimicry. The first one, of course, is lack of mimicry. This is the red Helen, which doesn't look like any of the toxic butterflies. Then you have this uh, uh, Malbar raven, where both the male and female uh, have the same wing pattern and they look like the crow butterflies, Euploia uh, butterflies. So the, this is a sexually monomorphic uh, mimicry. You have a case here where the male is not mimetic, only the female is mimetic. This is the Andaman Mormon. And then you have a case here uh, where the male looks like one toxic butterfly, the female looks like another toxic butterfly. So both males and females mimic, but they mimic very different toxic butterflies. And then you have uh, uh, this case, the case of the common Mormon, which is again, something that I've studied intensively for the last 10 years from the genetic and behavioral points of view. Uh, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. Uh, 
but I just wanted to point out that this is common Mormon. And if you want to read uh, interesting stuff about it, I can uh, point out to a few of my papers. So in this species, the male is non-mimetic. There's one female form which is non-mimetic. It looks like the male. This is the ancestral form of the butterfly. And we know this from some other uh, work. And then you have two mimetic female forms. This is form Stichias, which looks like the common rose. And this is form Romulus, which looks like the crimson rose. So these two female forms have evolved uh, more recently to look like the uh, toxic butterflies. And this is a beautiful uh, sex-limited polymorphic mimicry. Sex-limited because only females can be mimetic and polymorphic because there are multiple female forms, only some of which mimic these uh, models uh, or the toxic butterflies that they mimic. And this is common mime. This is yet another interesting case where both the males and females are uh, polymorphic. Uh, and this form is called dissimilis. This form is called uh, flitia. Uh, the dissimilis form uh, looks like the blue tiger and the glossy tiger. And the clitia form, the dark form, looks like the crow butterflies. Pretty stunning. And here is yet another case, the um, uh, great mime butterfly where again, male and female come in two forms. In one form, both males and females look fairly similar. And in the other form, male looks like the male of the striped, uh, striped uh, crow, striped blue crow. And the female looks like the female of striped blue crow. And this is pretty mind blowing. This is a case where male and female look male and female of a toxic butterfly, and they mimic the upper side and underside similarly. This is just phenomenal. This is something you can't even imagine. If you did not know about this, you will have to have some pretty crazy imagination to come up with ideas of how you could mimic and to what level you could mimic. So it's a very fascinating uh, thing. And this is what it looks like. As I mentioned, this great uh, blue mime in one form, this form Danisepa, both male and female look similar, but the upper side has this blue sheen similar to the upper side of uh, uh, this pied crow. And then the underside just lacks the blue sheen, but the color patches are similar. Again, similar to the uh, uh, crow butterfly that it mimics. And here again, the blue sheen is found only on the upper side, but its lack is much more striking on the underside. Uh, so it has all these uh, blue spots here, bluish spots here, which are lacking on the underside. And the male looks like the upper side of the male uh, uh, striped blue crow, underside looks like the underside of that crow and so on and so forth. In the female as well, it's pretty stunning. So way back uh, when I was a PhD student, I did a nice uh, comparative study where I showed this is the species tree of uh, papilio butterflies, swallowtail butterflies. Each butterfly listed here with its scientific name is a different species or a different form of the species. And each one of these spots, as you can see, is a different kind of mimicry. And what you will see is that most of the swallowtail butterflies are not mimetic. Mimicry has evolved independently in several groups of swallowtail butterflies. And in each group, the kind of mimicry that has evolved and how much it has diversified is different. And these are some of the examples. This is a common moment that I mentioned with the male and one female form uh, that looks like the uh, um, ancestral pattern of the butterfly. And then these are the two um, uh, mimetic females that have evolved. And what I was able to show using this uh, species tree is that these butterflies have diversified using a stepwise complexity. So most of the butterflies, the ancestors are non-mimetic and they're monomorphic, both males and females look similar. From these non-mimetic ancestors, these butterflies evolve a simple mimicry uh, type, either monomorphic or six limited mimicry. And this is something that you see, this is a non-mimetic ancestor from which one type of mimicry evolved, from which another type of mimicry evolved, from which a third type of mimicry evolved, right? So as you go through the species tree from the oldest species to the most recent species. What you see here at the tips of this species tree are existing species, species that uh, fly now. 
and at the nodes here at the branch uh, branching points here these are extinct butterflies which have got, uh, given rise to these uh, existing butterflies so as you go back and back in time uh, using some scientific method we can infer that all the older nodes all the branching points were non mimetic butterflies and in every single case you will see that one clade uh, gives rise from non mimetic ancestors to simple mimicry types to complex mimicry types and often polymorphic types so this is a repeating pattern and what it means is that from simple mimicry types you might get more species with just evolve that simple mimic type or it can go into more complex mimic types which can then uh, give rise to more species which uh, may have polymorphic or sexually dimorphic mimicry so this is something that uh, this is this was an idea put forth in uh, uh, the 70s and 80s and i was able to test it using some modern tools at the time using phylogenetic methods and comparative uh, methods and that was a very nice study that i was able to do and the reason why i spent some more time on this is to show how mimicry is an adaptation which can turn from simple patterns to complex patterns and a simpler set of uh, adaptations to more complex set of adaptations and the second point i wanted to make is that you don't have to be a big scientist to do this kind of work you just need very good ideas and fortunately as a phd student i happen to have a few interesting ideas and uh, you just need to look around to find interesting problems that you can solve either as a professional biologist or of course as an amateur uh, uh, nature and naturalist okay so how are these patterns so interesting how do they come about why are butterflies so uh, uh, evolved in terms of wing color patterns and uh, uh, colors uh one of the reasons why this is so is that butterflies are highly unusual in the sense that uh, the wing wing area is much more uh and this has helped them adapt uh, in various ways to use the colors and patterns in defense and these large wings just enhance that particular color pattern to the extent that this uh, color patch is not just small but it becomes even larger and the entire body mass so body mass of wings is or rather the mass of wings is really small but the area of the wings is much bigger than the area of the uh, rest of the body and that larger wing area compared to a relatively smaller body which is what is uh, quite special about butterflies and their wing uh, area and this is what has enhanced that entire color patch for various uh, of these things that i mentioned the four color uh, related adaptations that i mentioned but it's not only that the two colors uh, the two wing surfaces also offer opportunities for evolving differential patterns for example um, i will go back to the orange oak leaf where the upper side is very bright and that can be used in courtship whereas the underside can be very cryptic and that can be used against predators so the wings are the same but the upper side can be colored very differently than the underside and the upper side uh, has evolved to have coloration targeted towards attracting mates and then the underside has evolved to pool predators uh, and escape predation yeah and here the upper side can also be used in uh, uh, predator avoidance for example as i mentioned the pre upper side is so bright that when the butterfly is flying a predator might be uh, able to easily uh, track the bright colors but suddenly the butterfly sits down and, and then uh, it's sort of lost but most of the time these bright patterns on the upper side uh, evolve to attract mates rather than to fool predators and that's something that you will see in a lot of butterflies on the right side here is now the intermediate bush brown michaelis is intermedia and what you see here is the upper side the upper side looks more or less the same in all uh, uh, all seasonal forms but the underside like the common evening brown is variable in the wet season form it has these eye spots function of which is slightly debate, debated even now whereas in the dry season forms those uh, uh, eye spots vanish 
and then these butterflies are able to merge with the background they're able to camouflage much better and now what we know from uh, very detailed studies is that this particular eye spot on the upper side is used in courtship the center of that eye spot the white uh, marking in the center is uv reflective and that uv reflective nature of that eye spot is used in courtship and that's a very interesting way of uh, um, attracting mates i will uh, uh, remind you that humans for example cannot see uv color patterns so this spot looks white to us but uh, to them to butterflies which can see in uv light the spot will look uh, not white pure white like we see it but uh, they will also be able to see the ultraviolet the uv part of the color range and therefore it's going to be slightly different from the butterfly's perspective and even the predators which can see uv light those predators that can see uv light can see it but those predators which cannot see uv light will see this very differently uh okay so once these butterflies are relatively freed from constraints the wings can evolve into uh, very diverse color patterns uh the gallery of colors and patterns and patches that they can use to attack mates can be very very interesting it can also be used to avoid hybridization which is mating between two uh, sister species two closely related species uh, and not butterflies of the same species and hybridization again i'll remind you if you uh, uh, have a hybrid of spring of let's say horse and a donkey which is a mule it is uh, infertile it cannot reproduce uh, similarly ligers the uh, baby of a lion and a tiger uh, cannot reproduce it's an infertile offspring and that is what we mean by hybridization hybrids are often infertile in a lot of cases hybrids can be infertile and that is something that uh, all animals try to avoid uh, as far as possible sometimes there are mistakes but other times uh, commonly they try to avoid that so color patterns can be used uh, to attract mates of the right kind and avoid hybridization with the wrong species and uh, as i mentioned the range of sexually selected uh, color patterns can go beyond our visual system specifically uv Uh, patterns and in very rare cases near infrared so uv i'll remind you is the smaller wavelength of the light and uh, infrared is the longer wavelength of the light and uh, most of the color patterns used in courtship are towards the lower wavelength of the light uh, oh and i mentioned that uh, some butterflies can also detect polarized light yeah so if you don't know exactly what polarized light i don't want to spend time explaining it but sometimes certain kind of okay. that you see is polarized light if you know uh, if you have ever taken pictures you can get this polarizing filter which makes skies very deep blue for example or if there's a shining surface against which light is reflecting a polarizer can cancel that uh, uh, reflection so it's not exactly a reflection the same way uh, we see other reflections polarization is a slightly different form of play of light but that is what um, butterflies can uh, detect and now we know at least a couple of examples where polarized light is used in courtship and polarized light is present in one species not in its close relative and that is how they use it as a private channel to attract mates so it's a very interesting way of uh, avoiding predators on one hand uh, and then attracting mates on the other hand by compartmentalizing which color patch is exposed on which wing surface and how it is displayed when a butterfly is trying to escape from predators versus when it's actively uh, courting its mates and it wants to enhance that particular color patch and the way uh, this is seen i'll just very briefly show this is a close up of the head of a dragonfly butterfly uh, uh, heads are similar with very large compound eyes and each spot that you see here is a single uh, uh, lens what we call cornea yeah, in in these compound eyes and here on the right side you the scanning electron micrograph of uh, uh, the eye and each bump here you see is the cornea 
And then inside that you have a crystalline cone uh, uh, and then a pigment cell. And this is what prevents uh, this and the pigment cell here. These prevent uh, light from passing between two neighboring uh, 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 eye cells. Yeah? So here each one is there. So if a light is entering this cell at uh, this particular lens at some angle, the light won't go from this uh, uh, cornea uh, through the pigment cell into uh, the neighboring one, which will disrupt uh, color formation or rather vision formation. So this thing prevents that from happening. So what you will see is that this is a very long uh, uh, cell. Yeah? This is a very long, um, uh, sort of, if you are familiar with camera lenses, you can in some sense think of this as a long tele lens where lenses, where the light is going to come from a distance and it's going to get very narrow by the time it gets to the optic nerve here. Um, uh, here, and then this optic nerve is going to carry the signal, the, uh, the, the image of, uh, carried through that light to the brain and then brain is going to uh, make a compound image of each one of this uh, uh, eye cell, the lens through which light comes in and then it forms a cohesive picture of its surrounding. And this is really important. If you have seen dragonflies or butterflies or any other insects, in a lot of species, you will see that the eye is the, one of the largest structures on the head. And this dragonfly, for example, can see in the front through these lenses here, through the compound eye, and then uh, it can see the sides from here, it can see the top, it can see the bottom, and it can even see part of uh, its back. Yeah. So because this is so large, uh, these insects can be very um, alert and they can see everything around and therefore uh, they can stay uh, safe from predators. But then there's a problem that each one of these lens is going to form an independent image outwardly. But when it goes to the brain, because these optic nerves carry signal, uh, it carries a picture of a narrow picture coming from this lens. The brain has to process it, put all these small pieces together based on which part of the compound diet has come from. And then it forms a cohesive picture. So these dozens to thousands of units called omateria, each one of these is omateria and cornea, the lens is the only part that you see externally. This is what makes this compound vision and then the form of uh, the brain forms this. And butterflies have used this in uh, very interesting ways. So one of the first things that I mentioned to you about compound eye is that because it's so large, butterflies can see in all direction which helps them. But it can also enhance certain color patterns in interesting ways. And the color that is perceived during courtship, this is now act two, right? This is courtship. And I'm going to give you a few examples of butterflies uh, use these color patterns. In the last slides, before uh, the very last one, we were talking about the act one, which is evading predators. Now the next two or three slides is attract, attracting mates with sometimes the same color patches, sometimes different color patches based on the different uh, part of the wing. So uh, you might have seen these butterflies. Coleus butterflies are clouded yellows. They're very common in the Himalaya and Uremas are uh, grass yellows. They're common even in your backyard or by the roadside in Pune or really any part of India. So these two uh, kinds of butterflies, these are called uh, uh, whites and yellows. These butterflies use UV reflectance, ultraviolet reflectance as a sexual signal. And this work is done by Ron Rutowski, another uh, one of my favorite biologists, who has done a lot of work uh, on these in the, last seven, uh, in the last 50 years. And this is what the butterflies look like. Th these are uh, okay. patterns in our regular uh, usual light that we see. Uh, and on the right, you have the UV pattern. So on top you have male, this is in uh, regular visible light as seen by humans. And this is UV light. As you will see, based on how, how, where the uh, color, uh, where the light is coming from, the light will reflect as a UV patch or not. 
And here you have a female. The female doesn't have the UV reflective coloration, only the male does. So outwardly, the butterflies may look similar and you will notice that in visible light, the yellow spots on the black background are quite striking for us. But for butterflies in the UV light, what is most striking is almost the entire wing of the male is going to be UV reflective and the females are not going to be UV reflective at all. So that's a very, very striking difference. You wouldn't imagine that something that looks more or less similar here, uh, you know, these this yellowish orange uh, wing color that you see in male and female can be so different in UV light. And this is something that uh, these butterflies play with in courting to their potential mates. And we know several things that help them uh, attract mates based on how much you reflect us that, uh, that they show. First of all, we know again from a lot of experimentation that young males, uh, which are well-fed uh, as caterpillars, have more UV reflectance. So if you starve caterpillars in starve or give them low quality food, then the amount of UV reflectance that they produce as adults is small. This is almost like a human being very big and strong. If uh, he or she is fed on good food and abundant food as a kid, so that that kid is going to grow into a much larger size and a much stronger body. So beyond a certain growth uh, uh, stage, no matter how much you eat, you're not going to grow in size. You might become slightly stronger by growing more muscle mass, but you're not going to get bigger. This is that kind of a phenotype, which can be improved with some kind of feeding, but not otherwise. And of course, younger males uh, have more UV reflectance. As the butterflies go through their life, males are going to start losing that UV reflectance. And this is now very interesting. A female can judge whether uh, she is courting, she's being courted by the male of the right species because the UV reflective pattern that you see here is very different in sister species. So the female will know that uh, a male that is courting her is the right species or not. And the second thing is if there's an older male which has a, a lower UV reflective uh, nature, the female is also going to know that it's an older male which might have exhausted its energy reserves and therefore female may not be willing to mate with that older male. Whereas if there's a younger male which is full of energy, full of uh, energy uh, and nutrients that it can pass to the female, that is what the female will prefer. So this is how these UV reflective patches are used. This is almost like courtship in humans, right? A person with a... Uh, with a larger bank balance, with a bigger uh, uh, house, or maybe kinder, uh, uh, kinder, um, what's the word, um, mother or father-in-law, or somebody with a very good reputation. We always look for some qualities which are attractive. It need not always be physical attraction in case of humans, but we always look for some qualities. Somebody, you know, a stable family which has had a long reputation over generations, or at least in the previous generation of being very nice, or uh, other kinds of uh, uh, traits which are socially uh, desirable, or money, if uh, that is what you value. So what butterflies value are these qualities which reflect their physical or genetic uh, well-being. And that is what the females can choose uh, uh, mates based on. So this is a very different currency that they use and a very different way of advertising how good they are. And colors is a primary means of advertising how good they are as a mate. And in a lot of cases, it goes both ways. Even males choose to uh, court a certain female or not based on how the female looks and based on how she behaves. And of course, females will choose uh, to mate with males with which uh, through that mating, they're going to get something. And I'll mention some of those things later. And here is a second example. These are the neotropical uh, long wing butterflies, neotropical meaning uh, from Central and South America. You see these long wing butterflies. They're typically called long wing butterflies because their wings can be fairly long compared to other butterflies. And these butterflies, for example, use uh, polarized light. What you see here, left and right, this is again visible light. The, this is what you will see the butterfly. And this is what the butterfly will see. 
uh, in polarized light. Yeah? So these are two sister species. As you will see, both of them have this uh, bright white patch. Uh, rest of the color pattern looks different. But if you look at them, the polarized light through these white patches is quite different in the two species. And now some uh, experiments have shown, uh, given in this paper, that butterflies actually use these uh, uh, polarized lights. So uh, the blue sheen here and the white band here look very different in this and doesn't matter what the color patches are. The polarized uh, signal of the butterfly can be very different. And that is what this is based on. Right. The interesting thing uh, by Adriana Briscoe um, in a series of papers, I've just cited one paper in which they first showed this, but uh, Adriana has gone on to publish several uh, beautiful papers based on this idea of uh, duplicated genes. So opsin genes are uh, a family of genes. Opsins, if you know, these are uh, uh, genes and then proteins which uh, help organisms perceive color. So in our eyes, we have these opsin genes active and that is what makes us see colors. So in heliconius butterflies, this gene has a duplication and that duplicated copy is tuned to the UV reflectance of these butterflies. And that is used as a private channel, meaning that many of the predators and other insects and other predators cannot see this specialized reproductive pattern, this sexually uh, interesting, sexually attractive pattern, but only butterflies can see. And that, uh, that, that whole private channel of communication has opened up uh, all possibilities to attract mates and that is what these long-winged butterflies use. And uh, it's a fascinating story um, uh, revealed through several papers that we know of now. Uh, now, of course, courtship goes beyond visual signals. Visual signals may initiate courtship, but then chemical signaling and other aspects may take over. Uh, the milkweed butterflies, the plain tiger and uh, common crow and that kind of butterflies, shower females, the males uh, shower females with scent produced from specialized scales and hair pencils in their abdomen. So color might just be the first set of signals that butterflies use, but then they could use other kinds of uh, signals as well. And most, most uh, uh, species have what is called a spermatophore. It is a nuptial gift. It is uh, part of a package. So as we uh, know, typically during mating, uh, males pass on sperm to the females, but in many insects and other uh, invertebrates, males don't on, uh, not only pass on sperm, they also pass on very rare nutrients that females don't have access to. As a caterpillar uh, through leaves, butterflies get a lot of carbon, but they don't get enough uh, minerals. They don't get enough uh, salts. They don't get enough proteins. And these are sort of nutrients which females really require to make lots and lots of eggs. So what you will see is this phenomenon called mud puddling. All these butterflies which have congregated here in the case of these butterflies on the left, and there are these two moths as well on a rotting crab through which they are going to take up uh, proteins. And this is a close-up of that swarm where you will see the wing pattern of this butterfly. Uh, this is a hedge blue butterfly. And what you see is that all these males are uh, uh, sucking uh, uh, proteins and uh, minerals from the ground. And in this case, from a rock, uh, from a rotting crab. And these males uh, pick up all these minerals. And most of the mud puddling butterflies you will see are males. As you know, this is again, butterflies and humans are so different in so many ways but they're still animals, they still have very interesting things that are shared between them. So just like uh, what boys and girls do in a human society, if you have boys and girls in a butterfly society, females tend to be much more choosy, they tend to be much more cautious. They want the males to do a lot of work, they want the males to court a lot. And then of course, males have to work a lot to get something which is attractive to the females, otherwise females are not gonna be willing to mate with those males. 
and what butterflies give uh, as a nuptial gift as a sort of marriage proposal uh, to impress females are these rare nutrients that females don't have easy access to and females largely stay away from these mud puddling spots but they get these nutrients from males during mating and we don't know exactly how this occurs but a series of experiments has shown that a male which gives a larger uh, nuptial gift is more likely to mate uh, to be accepted as a mate by a female and then uh, those males which stay mated for longer the females which have got a bigger uh, uh, spermatophore is less likely to mate with a second male for a long time um, if that first male has passed on a lot of nutrients and the interesting idea there is that larger the spermatophore it can last a female longer to make more eggs and all the sperm that go along with those nutrients uh, fertilize more and more of the eggs of this female and that is the advantage of passing on a big spermatophore it's sort of uh, provisioning the female with a lot of nutrients with which it can make more eggs and of course more eggs that uh, your sperm fertilize better your uh, fitness your mate, uh, mating success is going to be your reproductive success is going to be that is the idea behind passing on a larger spermatophore so we still don't know how females judge which male is going to uh, provide a larger spermatophore somehow they know it and that is how uh, uh, they delay mating with another male if they ever mate with a second male so very interesting parallel between uh, how these females give a larger uh, weightage la preference for a more attractive mate through various ways all right so this is all i wanted to talk about color uh, we are uh, uh, about 1 hour into the talk what i'm going to end with is mentioning that uh, these are all nice stories i hope you have enjoyed them and of course if you have questions i will take questions in uh, just a little bit but i what i wanted to tell you i started out by saying is that uh, was that i wanted to tell you these stories because this should be one more reason to care about uh, the biodiversity and the environment around us so i'm going to very briefly speak to you about that of course this is not a group which is completely unfamiliar with the plight of nature and biodiversity around us but i'm just going to show you a few pictures and show you what could be done uh, to um deal with the crisis that we uh, face right now so butterflies like everything else face a lot of challenges nowadays uh, we have a widespread habitat loss habitat degradation fragmentation uh, caterpillars are especially uh, vulnerable to pesticides and so on and here is on the right uh, this is a picture i took in sikkim in the lower right corner here you see beautiful forests which had just been cleared for agriculture and now that people have more money people can build uh, uh, better houses uh, more weatherproof houses which of course everybody likes these big buildings are coming up um, uh, even in these beautiful forests so the big question is how do we make sure that the nature persists at the same time uh, humans becoming slightly more comfortable in their habitat and we all agree that uh, all these people in uh, remote areas all the people in rural areas have to live a more comfortable life they need slightly more access to uh, resources around them slightly more money uh, so that they can live comfortably and perhaps send their kids to uh, better schools give them better education and so on and so forth but then we also want the nature to persist so how do we strike this balance and often um, the situation around looks fairly depressing and often it is i'm not going to sugar coat it saying that everything is fine but in a country like india which is which has one of the largest populations one of the largest densities of uh, human populations as well but also one of the best uh, uh, levels of biodiversity so um, what i'm going to show you is uh, sort of various ways in which you can help this biodiversity persist uh, in bengaluru for example we have this long running uh, unique experiment of citizen science 
there's a Bengaluru butterfly group. Uh, we uh, go out every couple of weeks and we count butterflies and that has produced a lot of the data. These are some of the people who are involved in running those. And uh, we have created a massive data set of uh, butterflies going through different seasons. And then um, uh, this kind of data set, actually this figure is a little bit older, over 50,000 observations was what we had before the pandemic. In March, after the lockdown, the number has gone to over 90,000 uh, observations. So the pandemic has actually been very good to uh, uh, accumulate more data. And this has provided very interesting insights into seasonal and yearly population dynamics, effect of urbanization of butterfly uh, numbers and so on and so forth. And this is very promising to understand both the biology of butterflies and also how we can use that understanding to help butterflies uh, persist in a landscape. So this also has quite a lot of potential in influencing biodiversity conservation. So we should start something like this. We should all get involved. There are various ways in which you could do this. In your neighborhood, for example, you could create butterfly gardens. You can plant uh, 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 flowers. You can plant trees, which attract butterflies either to feed as adult butterflies or uh, to lay eggs on, on which the caterpillars can feed. So butterfly gardening is one thing that you can easily do. You can uh, uh, avoid spraying pesticides as much as you can. Of course, I understand you love your lemon plants and you don't want them to be eaten by uh, some caterpillars that you see. But you know, once in a while you could uh, perhaps tolerate a caterpillar and maybe it will turn into a lime butterfly or a common mormon. And of course, you can just selectively uh, um, protect your most precious plants, but generally there is interesting uh, things to learn from some of the insects that you might see. And caterpillars invariably lead to uh, a butterfly or a moth. That might be something interesting that you want to support. And of course, you can contribute to Butterflies of India website. Uh, this is what it looks like. It has a very nice uh, uh, platform, a nice interface where you can see the scientific name and uh, the English name. And of course, the taxonomic information, subspecies in India and so on and so forth. You can see what the butterfly looks like. You can see its distribution. Under each one of these tabs, you can see various aspects of that butterfly. You can see its early stages, what the caterpillar and the pupa looks like, the plants on which it feeds uh, as caterpillars. And you can just help butterflies with uh, all these things. If you want to know what plants you should uh, uh, grow around your either household or in your uh, neighborhood uh, park or in nearby forest areas. You could perhaps, for example, work with the forest department. You could work with your city uh, garden, um, uh, whatever uh, municipal agency, which looks after parks and recreation. You could work with them and help them understand that they should plant more plants, which are biodiversity friendly. So if you want to know those things, you could go to uh, uh, these larval host plant tabs. If you go under uh, butterfly biology, there again, there's a list of plants which Indian butterflies use. And if you are familiar with plants, and of course, uh, uh, Dr. Wertak and others in this group probably know a lot about plants. And many of the plants that you're familiar with are used as uh, larval host plants. And of course, you will be at, uh, at a very good position to talk to either forest department or parks uh, department around you, or even your, your, you know, your housing complex. Within your housing complex, you could plant some plants which, which will help native biodiversity. Not just butterflies, even other insects. You could plant something that attracts birds. You could plant something that uh, attracts beetles, for example. This is, this, these are simple things to which you could uh, help conserve butterflies. And of course, if you want to do more, if you can afford to do more, if you are a forest officer, for example, or if you know a forest officer, a forest officer can do on ground much more to help uh, conserve butterflies than others. So you could influence uh, conservation policy, you could uh, influence conservation action so that butterflies uh, manage to persist even in dense cities like uh, uh, 
Pune and Bengaluru and even uh, Mumbai. And I hope that we will all work towards that. So I mentioned, I started out by saying that as we grow older, we uh, tend to lose the wonder about butterflies. So what I'm going to end with is, I've told you a lot of stories, a lot of words. I'm going to end with just showing you some stunning butterflies uh, that I recall right now. And I won't speak anything. I won't tell you what those butterflies are. I just want you to appreciate the beauty of those butterflies in these slides. So I'm just going to run those slides. With that, I'll say thank you, uh, everyone, for taking time out today to listen to these stories. If you want to know more about our research work, uh, you can go to my lab website, biodiversitylab.org, and you can read about what we do. And of course, uh, whether you want to know more about research or not, you can always go to the Butterflies of India website and um, uh, look at uh, butterflies, and that will always be a lot of fun. What I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to just paste a link in um, in the chat window. So if uh, you don't have it open, please quickly have it open. We are conducting a national butterfly poll uh, in India right now. India doesn't have a national butterfly. We have a national animal, national uh, uh, bird, national tree, and so on and so forth. But we don't have a national butterfly. So what we are doing is getting uh, opinion from uh, getting your vote to uh, for a national butterfly. We have uh, seven butterflies, seven butterfly species. And we would like you to um, vote. And of course, once you have voted, pass this on. I've just uh, uh, pasted that link there, http uh, tiny.cc uh, national butterfly poll. So you can just go uh, from that. And of course, uh, you can go to the Butterflies of India website. I will in fact paste that link as well and read a little bit more about the poll. And you can also uh, see the seven species on which people are voting. Maharashtra is actually doing very well. We have more than 35, oh, about 35,000 votes. And out of that, Maharashtra is uh, probably uh, 40, 50 percent, something like that. But we would certainly like uh, more voting. And ideally, we should reach at least uh, 1 lakh votes. So please spread the word around. And let's help the government uh, choose uh, a national butterfly. With that, I'll absolutely stop. And if you have any questions, uh, I'll take questions for some time. Chan lecture. That was very good. 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 Very good
एक दोन दिस मला डॉक्टर रेखा देशमुख यांनी विचारलंय डू यू थिंक द कॅमोफ्लेज अँड मिमिक थिअरी ऑफ एक्सटर्नल अपियरन्स कॅन बी ऑब्झर्व इन ह्युमन जस्ट इन द अटायर मोर यंग विमेन वेअरिंग द जीन्स अँड टॉप्स सुटलू वाईल व्हेरी स्मॉल पर्सेंटेज ऑफ मेल्स वेअर फिमेल अटायर as to either stop attracting predators well that is an interesting thought i don't think it particularly works in a biological system yeah. a we don't have the same kind of predation that uh, other organisms have but in some ways you could argue for example we know the joan of arc uh, had uh, in uh, france of course long time ago had uh, dressed up very differently uh, zashi chirani the we know that she uh, dressed um, in a way that would um, allow her to uh, go to the battlefield so in some way you could argue that this has uh, helped but it's not exactly the same kind of biological dynamics for which the theory of mimicry has been developed so i won't try to uh, fit that into uh, uh, that particular idea but of course we try to mimic in a non biological way in other ways um, so you could perhaps apply that thought in other context but not uh, particularly in the context of either predation or even social uh, protection which uh, you might argue for and i think this person was uh, arguing for it so uh, there is another comment from vivek date i will uh, read comments from the chat window of zoom and of course uh, you can read questions from uh, youtube and uh, facebook and i will we will try to get to all of them so vivek date says can zigzag random motion of butterflies be considered as a strategy to escape from predators absolutely so as i mentioned colors is only one way butterflies escape predators when they discovered of course erratic flight the exact uh, random motion as uh, vivek that they mm-hmm. said will help them uh, escape predators especially those which are going to pursue if you are talking about let's say crab spider which uh, uh, sits motionless close to a flower or some other patch where butterflies and other insects are going to come and then it just grabs it so zigzag motion will not be uh, effective against Uh, a crab spider but it will certainly be uh, effective against birds let's say so zigzag motion is part of a of an entire set of protective strategies that butterflies use so that's a very good point it's just not visual uh, and therefore i had not mentioned it but absolutely butterflies use all, all means uh, at their disposal disposal to uh, uh, evade predators Uh, Surekha Agarkar says Fulpakre Koshadun Bahai Rehna said Kenyachi Sarva Sadharan Vair Konti Aste Ki Divas Bharat Kadhi Yehu Shaktar So I'll just translate this in English in case there are uh, non-Marathi speakers in the audience. Uh, Surekha is asking, do butterflies come out uh, of the pupae, do they eclose as we say technically at a certain time or could they come at any time of the day? butterflies could come at any time of the day that is true but many butterflies tend to come out of the pupa early in the morning and some of the uh, butterflies which are active during the evening and during early morning they might come out uh, very late in the afternoon or sometime when it's dark before uh, uh, before there is light but typically most butterflies tend to come out in a slightly narrow range of uh, times depending on uh, what their biology is and what predators they might be escaping from because when the butterfly comes out of the pupa it's completely helpless its wings are still crumpled it can't fly off it can't do anything and therefore it has to be protected in this vulnerable stage so butterflies try tend to come out when they are less vulnerable to the kinds of predators that they need to worry about uh, but yes technically uh, theoretically they could come out any time of the day or night but most of them tend to come out uh, really early in the morning or uh, even in the dark
sir if you uh, find another question from uh, youtube or uh, facebook let me know i'm just reading through zoom chat to find okay. if there any question sir anirudh waidya is asking what is the average time for butterfly to come out of pupa uh, it typically takes just coming out of the pupa just that uh, window is pretty short butterfly after it opens up the pupa with legs it just pushes the pupa and from behind the head and along the antennae the front part of the pupa just opens up like a door and then the butterfly crawls out of it so just that part completely pulling itself out takes just a few seconds but as i mentioned the wings are all crumpled uh, inside the pupa and then slowly with gravity and with blood flow through the wings the wings are going to uh, unfurl and the wings are of course wet when the butterfly comes out wings have to uh, completely spread and then dry up that can take anything between uh, uh, 10 to 15 minutes to more than a uh, half an hour depending on ambient temperature if it's hot and uh, dry the wings will dry up faster if it is not that uh, hot and uh, dry then it will take a little bit longer so depending on the ambient uh, conditions mainly temperature and humidity butterfly uh, wings might harden up but it takes at least 10 or 15 minutes before butterfly can take off and if butterflies come out when it's still dark or otherwise it's not their time to fly they can just stay there for several hours before they take their first flight so the absolute period uh, that they have to uh, wait before they can fly is 10 to 15 minutes but it can be longer depending on uh, the surroundings and time of the day or night and things like that dr rekha deshmukh says do you think the camouflage and mimicry theory of external appearance can be observed oh that that was one that you just read so that's fine um then there are a few thank you kind of um okay Rekha Deshmukh has another uh, comment. During this pandemic, I have taken to this beautiful project, butterfly conservation, in a small way, around my uh, housing complex, and in garden uh, groups. I'm very, uh, I am by educating them not to kill caterpillars. So she is doing something. She is spreading the word around that we shouldn't be uh, killing caterpillars, because butterflies uh, develop from caterpillars. so that's a very nice initiative the least you can do is spread the word around of and um, i hope that you will do this more if you can't plant uh, of course uh, butterfly larval oak plants or nectar plants yourself at least you can protect them in uh, your neighborhood garden or whatever else uh, that you can use um then mission devrai has put up a question here probably from somewhere else how much a uh, time span uh, has to go uh, for biological evolution to come about so we don't know exact time the minimum amount of time or the maximum amount of time that mimicry has taken up theoretically it can be as uh, quick as several hundred generations so potentially several hundred uh, uh, years of evolution but you will almost never find a case where uh, mimicry has evolved this fast typically it takes uh, tens of thousands if not lakhs of uh, uh, generations for mimicry to evolve with the common mormon butterfly we have dated exact timeline when uh, the mimicry uh, phenotypes the mimetic wing patterns have evolved and it is again uh, a matter of several lakhs of generations uh and we are publishing that so you will get to see that uh, soon the data from which we have inferred how, how long ago the mimicry evolved but it it is believed that typically it will take several lakhs of generations several hundred thousands of years before mimicry will evolve and it can be multiple uh, million years Min- uh, several mil- uh, hundred thousand years is more or less a common understanding that that's a minimum amount of time butterflies are going to take for a mimicry to evolve but really large complex uh, mimicry rings meaning uh, communities of butterflies which look like each other that typically takes tens of millions of years to evolve so the timelines are pretty long for mimicry to evolve so there has to be consistent 
and persistent uh, selection pressure, predation pressure on uh, these color patterns for mimicry or even for somatism to evolve. Uh, Anirudh Vaidya has asked average pupil time that I've seen. Ila um, Joshi asked Pune Made Ashi Kunti Zade Ahed Jawar Fulpakre. Justi uh, Dista, Butterfly Garden Sati, Kima Kunti Zade, Lau Shapto. Amba Ekup Sanglazade, Ambever Punyamade, Common Baron Fidota, Ambever Barazda Plegade, Dendropti Falcata, Manje, Bangula, Ugota. The Bangula were actually Don Kivatin Zatiji Hulpakra Punyamade Varta. Common Zizabel, Indian Zizabel Jalamanta. Te Bangura or Warta, um, Peacock Royal now is a full park group. Take Hoop the even Sharama is the Warta Bangura. So Bangura is actually a dendropti, which is also called um, uh, what in English? Um, I forget the English name, but anyway, dendropti and that kind of hemiparasites uh, are really good. They're Harmful for the plant because they take their uh, nutrition from plants, part of their nutrition from plant, uh, host plants. But they're also a nice uh, larval host plant. So if you can tolerate some uh, hemiparasites, some dendrophy, oh, hun uh, honeysuckle, I think is what it's called in English. So uh, that would be a good plant to um, encourage. Among others, uh, of course, Bahawa. Um, Copper pot tree, uh, copper pod, or amaltas is uh, what it is known as in English. So Cassia fistula is the scientific name. That's a very nice plant. Uh, mottled immigrant, common immigrant, and uh, common evening, uh, common grass yellow feeds on uh, Cassia fistula. So that's something that you can uh, plant. And it's nice because the flowers are so beautiful. Uh, it's a medicinal plant as well. And of course, its leaves support these three butterfly species. Model immigrant, not so much, but common immigrant or lemon immigrant and uh, common grass yellow certainly are, uh, uh, they feed on this plant quite uh, commonly. If you want to encourage slightly wilder plants, uh, Caparis zelanica is something, I don't know its Marathi name or even English name, but Caparis is a group of plants which have hooked spines and Caparizelanica has two, uh, a pair of hooked spines at each node. And it's a very common plant. If you go uh, in your neighborhood in a neglected corner, you will see it. If you go to Sinhagar or uh, uh, Pasgao Parvati or any other uh, hill around Pune, you will see this plant. And I had uh, uh, planted it in our house uh, earlier and it grows pretty wild. It will grow into a very large um, uh, straggler and if you have, let's say, a house, a bungalow, and if you have walls around it, this will be a very good plant to grow on your uh, bungalow walls. It grows quite well. It grows, uh, grows quite profusely. And I mentioned that specifically because it's a terrific plant. Uh, common gull, pioneer, uh, common Indian wanderer, and then uh, psyche, at least four butterflies will feed on it in Pune area and several more species in other parts of India. Lemon plants, curry leaf plants are terrific. Uh, lemon, uh, lemon and other citruses support common Mormon, lime swallowtail and blue Mormon in Pune, as well as the lime blue, uh, which is much tinier. Its caterpillars are slightly harder to find because they're small and green like the leaf, but these four species feed on uh, lemon and uh, uh, orange and other citrus plants. That will be quite good. Curry leaf is from the same family and that will support uh, uh, these same butterflies. Uh, what else grows commonly? Assistacea. Uh, that's another uh, common plant. So, sir, uh, sir, you and others who know uh, about butterflies can perhaps uh, quickly type um, Marathi names there, or you could just interrupt me and uh, mention the Marathi names of these plants. Uh, um, upon um, 
याला बार्लेरियाला काय म्हणतो बार्लेरिया क्रिस्टाटा अँड दॅट काइंड ऑफ प्लांट दोज आर अगेन ग्रोन इन गार्डन कोरांटी कोरांटी ग्रेट Kuranti is another terrific plant because uh, all pansies, uh, lemon plant, pansy, blue pansy, yellow pansy, grey pansy, chocolate pansy, and what's what is the six species of pansies in India. Uh, I'll have to go through the list again to figure out which one is many. But all six uh, species of pansies feed on uh, Kuranti, Barleria cristata, and other Barleria. So that will be quite a good plant. Again, like Bahawa has interesting flowers. it's something that we already plant uh, in our gardens uh, easy to grow in pots so that's something that we we'll, i will certainly recommend uh, let's see atu uh, sir tumcha pustaka varunach ek mi list taiyar keli hoti maybe we can share that uh, with the group as a group absolutely uh, share it with the group and yeah. if you go to butterflies of india website i found uh, butterflies.org the butterfly biology the first link that is given is for the larvulous plants yeah. so you can also see plants from that yeah. so uh, poly polyalthea longifolia uh, uh, paul sashok hmm. is another plant which supports at least two species of butterflies in pune uh, the um, tail jay and common jay both of them hmm. feed on this uh, plant uh, this plant in larval stages so that's that's a roadside plant it's already planted there's yeah. no there are uh, uh, caterpillars on these plants then in um, yeridi i already mentioned bahawa which is quite a popular plant for these two uh, butterflies as well as for people and um, other cassia or sena as that genus is now called um, uh, sena tora is takai you know takai tora right takai takra is takra is one plant which is used by uh, uh, common grass yellow sena auriculata is used by mortal immigrants so that's another uh, interesting plant now these are not typically grown in gardens but these occur uh, these grow along roadside or in scrub forest around uh, uh, ponds and lakes and so on so these are plants you should look for and you will find uh, caterpillars of nice species there so that's something that you could uh, do for nectar plants you could uh, uh, of course plant um, uh, lantana which is already common and lantana is a nice flower uh, on which a lot of butterflies come easy to photograph uh, butterflies on lantana but apart from that of course you have others ixona is a very nice plant used by uh, butterflies like indian wanderer or uh, mormons for example as nectar plant So you should ideally have a combination of nectar plants and lavalose plants, not just one kind of plants. And more species you use, better it is because that just going to be nicer for a, a broader range of species of bird uh, to support their populations. And I see Anirudh, uh, there are lots of uh, friends and other people I know. Of course, my mother is there. I see that. uh we were uh, medical uh and it by to my thais kutumbas the tikade this day vartak sir of course if i haven't noticed you just raise your hand and say hello of course uh while i look for the next question hi हॅलो जानकी ताई आई तुझा मायक्रोफोन बंद आहे तो सुरू कर मग तुला बोलता येईल मी हा ऐकू येईल तुम्ही बोलू शकता अनम्यूट करा जानकी ताई तिकडे खाली एक अनम्यूट बटन दिसतंय मायक्रोफोन सारखं त्याच्यावर क्लिक कर म्हणजे तुझा आवाज ऐकू येईल आम्हाला हा यस आता बोल हा बोला कोण छान मला जानकी ताई कोण म्हणता मला सगळेच म्हणतायत आता एवढं कृष्ण मेघांच्या समोर लेक्चर त्यांचा ऐकल्यानंतर तुला जाकू कस म्हणणार ना नाही त्यालाही आवडतं माहितीये त्याला आईला जाकू म्हणतात ते 
त्यामुळे त्याला तसं काही वाटणार नाही मी म्हंटल मी जानकी ताई मी म्हंटल प्रिया डॉक्टर मुकुंद काजळ्यांचा एक प्रश्न आहे हाऊ डू इंटरप्रिट फॉसिल रेकॉर्ड लुकिंग एट द डिव्हर्सिटी अँड मिमिक्री पॅटर्न एनी थॉट वुड यू अप्रिशिएट इट सो अ व्हेरी इंटरेस्टिंग पॉईंट अनफॉर्च्युनेटली कलर्स आर नॉट प्रिझर्व्ह इन फॉसिल ओनली विंग शेप अँड अदर थिंग्स कॅन बी यू सो फॉसिल्स हॅव बीन यूज फॉसिल्स हॅव बीन डिस्कवर्ड अँड देन यूज इन स्टडिंग बर्ड ऑफ लाईफ अँड द रिव्होल्युशन बट अनफॉर्च्युनेटली बिकॉज कलर पॅटर्न आर नॉट रिटेन्ड we really can't tell uh, whether those colors ev- had evolved at a certain time point or not fortunately now uh, using genetic uh, work we can estimate at what time certain mutations occurred and based on that we can uh, estimate when mimicry patterns might have evolved that is how we have figured out uh, common mormon yeah. mimetic patterns so uh, unfortunately fossils are not particularly useful but certainly genetic data can be yes. thank you sir thank you sure ah uh, patak sir ha bola ajun kai questions kai asle tar tikde host plants baddal parat kuni tar lele hai pan tya baddal mi already bollelo hai ho ho kelel nasel tar mag parat particularly mal sanga तुमचा ईमेल आय डी देता का हा देतो अजून कोणी तरी प्रश्न विचारलाय हाऊ मेनी डिफरंट स्पीसीज ऑफ बर्ड ऑफ लाईफ इन होल ऑफ वर्ल्ड अँड इन इंडिया सो इन द वर्ल्ड देर आर मोर दॅन एटीन थाउजंड स्पीसीज आय वॉन्ट से एन एक्झॅक्ट नंबर बिकॉज एव्हरी इयर ऑलमोस्ट एव्हरी मंथ न्यू बर्ड ऑफ लाईफ स्पीसीज रेकॉर्डेड सो बाय नाव वी प्रॉब्ली हॅव क्लोजर टू नाईन्टीन थाउजंड नोन स्पीसीज ऑफ बर्ड ऑफ लाईफ and there are many species which have not been described yet in south america in parts of africa and even in india we are dis- uh, discovering new species in 2015 i described a new species called the banded tit and i'm describing several more uh, species now so um, uh, the actual number is uh, rising all the time but ballpark figure you can remember about 19000 species for the whole world and for india again the number is increasing we are also finding species which are known to science but they were not reported from india earlier and now they are reported so even that number is increasing but the last checklist that i prepared has uh, almost close to uh, 1440 species but that number will increase and i estimate that the total number of butterflies in india when everything is discovered the butterflies which have not been recognized as uh, new species of butterflies that have not been reported from india but they were known from uh, they are known from neighboring areas and uh, sometimes what are known as subspecies might be elevated might be treated as species as we know more about them so these three kinds of uh, additions to the butterfly fauna of india when all of that is done i suspect that we might have as many as 17 or 1800 species of butterflies but only about 4 uh, 1400 something species 1400 plus species are known so far close to 1440 so far but that number will rise i hope that in my lifetime before i die there will be enough people going around watching butterflies that either by reporting butterflies which were not known from india earlier or butterflies which are genuinely new to science and butterfly species which were uh, treated as subspecies but now they should really be treated as species all of that we will cross at least 1500 or 1600 species but there's a lot of work to be done people often think that we know all the species in india that is not true we are discovering new species for india all the time and i hope that we will reach that 1600 or 1700 number in the next couple of decades two butterfly hibernate or migrate ha prashna hai revati acha butterflies definitely hibernate and migrate depending on the species so some uh, butterfly species have uh, Uh, adapted to migrate and painted ladies are a very common example 
um, which has at least local migrations every year and even regional migrations in other parts of the world. Uh, the dark blue tiger, blue tiger, double branded crow and common crow uh, have annual migrations in Southern India. So they go from the Western Ghats, pass through Mysore, uh, Bangalore area and go all the way to the Eastern Plains. So that's an annual migration which happens like clockwork just before the monsoon uh, or as the pre-monsoon showers start, they will start migrating out of the Western Ghats and they'll go to the Eastern Plains. And the reverse migration happens sometime in uh, September to November, depending on when the Northwest, I mean, Northeast uh, monsoon starts. So that's a spectacular migration. And uh, we have just published our second paper on that migration last month. My PhD student, Vaishali Baumik, has done wonderful work on that migration. Last month, we also, in the paper that we published, we also covered the migration of lemon immigrant and mottled immigrant. That's again a migration. Uh, migration, or rather, I would call it dispersal. So, what these butterflies do is, as caterpillars, they swarm on certain plants. They will just finish off all the larvae plants, all the leaves from the plants, and then the next generation, the butterflies come out of uh, the pupae that these caterpillars make, have nowhere to go. Then these uh, freshly emerging butterflies will go to another area, anywhere between uh, uh, several tens of kilometers away to potentially as many as several hundreds of kilometers away. And they would mate and legs in that area. And these migrations again happen every year, but where they will have occur and when they, the time frame in which they will uh, uh, migrate. We do know that um, they will migrate a certain amount of time before, my, before uh, uh, Southwest monsoon begins. And these butterflies will come back to the Western Guards uh, before uh, the uh, northeast monsoon arrives in uh, eastern part of India. The migrations of immigrants are a little bit less understood and we don't know how to predict them and perhaps they cannot be predicted because they're based on resources. So if in one year caterpillars don't finish off all the uh, larval host plants, they may not disperse. If they finish uh, host plants multiple times in a year, they might disperse several times. But every time they finish off food plants, which direction they will fly in cannot be predicted. And we suspect that these are completely unpredictable movements because within the same month, in different parts of India, but not very far away, let's say 50 kilometer, 100 kilometer away, you might see butterflies going in very different directions. So based on that, we suspect that those dispersers, this dispersing movements are going to be more unpredictable based on where food might be found. So that's about migration. Uh, and there are many other species. Uh, uh, lime swallowtail, for example, has been known to migrate. Uh, pea blues have been known to migrate. Several other small and large butterflies are known to migrate. The immigrants and the tigers and crows are the most spectacular of them all in India because those happen every year. And when those happen, you will see tens of thousands of butterflies. And in case of um, tigers and crows, you will see millions of butterflies flying. So that is quite remarkable. We do know that butterflies remain dormant. Uh, they are either hibernate in winter or estivate during summer. There are two different terms for when they remain dormant. Uh, hibernation, of course, people believe is most common, but in drier areas, estivation uh, remaining dormant during dry period and hot period is more likely, which is quite possible in a lot of places in India. So when larvalose plants and nectar plants are going to be scarce, or in case of Himalaya or let's say Kutch, when temperatures are going to be unbearably low or unbearably high during certain seasons, butterflies will remain dormant either as uh, eggs, caterpillars, UP, and in rare cases, even as adult butterflies. So that is also known. And the example that I will cite for butterflies that remain dormant is pot partridge. It's a very common butterfly in dry deciduous and uh, moist deciduous forests. If you go to Thane area, for example, uh, you will see lots and lots of them. If you go to uh, any deciduous forest, basically in the Western Ghats or Central India, you will see these in hundreds and thousands 
during uh, spring and summer. So about February to May or sometimes early June. And that butterfly um, breeds during this time. The caterpillars then remain dormant and the pupae, I mean not caterpillars, they'll pupate and the pupae will remain dormant for anywhere between eight to 10 months. And uh, from about uh, mid uh, uh, monsoon until next spring, the pupae remain dormant. So if you look at the uh, lifespan of this butterfly, it spends more time as a pupa than it spends as a uh, as an adult. And that's an interesting uh, point. Many butterflies may spend more time as a pupa than as an adult butterfly, both because they might get eaten as an adult butterfly sooner, or in case of, let's say, a male, a male might mate with a female and then die soon after that, whereas a female might uh, stay alive for a week or two or three or four weeks while she is laying eggs. Uh, so in that case, females might live longer than the pupal stage, but male might live shorter than the pupal stage and so on and so forth. So lifespan is a very interesting factor which is linked to the heart. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Krishnamit Kunte. आता माया ते अपन थम्बू या आजून का ही प्रश्न कुनाला आस्तील तो तू भी तरना पर्सनली तेंचा ईमेल आईडी और विचारु शक्ता ही इस गोइंग टू शेयर इज ईमेल आईडी बाय द वे आई हैव आल्सो शेयर्ड द लिंक फॉर द लार्वलोस प्लांट्स ऑफ इंडियन बर्डोफ्लाइज जस्ट लुक अप द चैट एंड सर इफ यू कैन जस्ट for uh, a butterfly nas national butterfly poll for larvalose plants and of course the link where uh, they can go and vote that right. will be good mm -hmm. and i will also share my email address by the way i am not on whatsapp so if you send whatsapp messages i'm not going to see them but if you send an email i will get back to you but again please if you're going to write to me prepare uh, the questions well do some background reading before you uh, write to me because I'm trying to finish a lot of writing. I'm uh, involved in a lot of uh, different projects. So of course I cannot uh, respond to emails like, you know, if you just ask me where do butterflies go at night, I'm very unlikely to respond to those emails. But if you want to ask me things about how you can help something, you know, butterfly conservation in your area and things like that, then I will of course uh, respond. If you have questions about how you can contribute to the Butterflies of India website, there again I can uh, uh, answer. But of course, if you go to the website, you can see a link at the top for contributing images uh, or observations of Butterflies of India. So do some preparation before you write to me. I don't mind sharing my email address, but uh, please use it carefully so that I can um, answer questions to which you cannot. Uh, easily find an answer. Um, if you can find an answer easily on the internet, of course, do that search first, and then um, I'll be happy to answer your questions. So I've given my, uh, I've shared my email address here. So thanks again. I hope you have enjoyed this talk and hopefully I will do another program 